Okay, can you start by giving us your full name? So my full name is Sophie Elizabeth Jenkins. Great, and uh, whereabouts do you live at the moment, Sophie? I live in Kasmal at the moment, Punchestown. Great, and uh, where did you grow up? So I grew up uh, a lot in the Brimbarian area, but also uh, in the sort of um, Hermon, Llanvernach area, and also in the Manachlog the area, because I've got family connections and I've lived in a few of those areas um, when I was sort of growing up, basically. Great. So do you want to tell us sort of how long you spent in all of... So, uh, so just for clarity, they're all in the Preseli, aren't they? Yes, yeah, so, yeah, they're all in the Preseli area, yeah. So you've lived your whole life in the Preseli yeah, area? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. How long did you spend in all those different areas? <laughs> so um, I was, well, when I was younger, uh, so I was born in um, Withybush Hospital in Haverford West, um, and my parents, to begin with, uh, lived with my grandparents who had uh, a bed and breakfast called Castellan um, in Blind Force. So that's where I lived when I first was first born. Um, then um, they had a mobile home um, on my great aunt's farm in Brimberian called Glyneroin. So that's where I lived for the first few years of my life. Um, then they, so that's, so my family are from, uh, Brimberian, but they also bought a farm, um, in Llanvernach. So the farm hadn't been lived in for many, many years. So, um, they couldn't just move into it. So from the mobile home, we went and lived in a family owned house in Hermon. Um, and then, um, from there, we eventually moved in to the farm in Llanvernach. Um, but my grandparents then moved to Manachlogdi, and all my father's family are from Brimberian, so I spent a great deal of time in all of those areas, really. Okay, great. Um, and so, how would you describe the Priscelli area to someone who, who's never been, been here? Um, it's a very sort of ancient landscape. Uh, very rural communities, uh, lots of intangible uh, heritage surrounding the area, lots of uh, myths and legends, folklore, and a very traditionally Welsh-speaking area in Wales and in Pembrokeshire. And how does that affect the people that are from this area, do you think? Um, I think a lot of them have got that uh, sense of identity of being from the Priscelli area as an actual place. Uh, as an overarching place rather than from the village that they're in. Um, yeah. Great. What, what are the positive, what are the good things about um, living in an area like this? Um, I think it's just that you feel like you're a part of something bigger than um, just where you live, I suppose. Um, it's that... Um, that Kenevin, I suppose, your, your, well, yeah, your, your, it's just really just the whole area just feels like home, I suppose. It's that, um, yeah, I suppose it's difficult to explain. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so it's to do with community? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so there's a, there's a strong sense of, of community in these areas, especially the, um, I would say the traditional Welsh speaking aspect of these areas, um, there's lots of um, events and things that go on that tie it all together. Great. And is there, are there any sort of negatives, any downsides of living in an area like this? Um, it's become an area where lots of people want to move to and live in because it is very, very beautiful. But uh, that does create tension for local people, especially young people, when they want to um, remain in the home area basically okay okay <clears throat> do you have a do you have a favorite area of the Priscelli's um Brimberian is probably my favorite area I'd, I'd say um mainly because that's where um my father's family have lived for generations so that kind of feels like the um yeah the sort of the well yeah, the centre of the world in in, in the Priscelli area to me, I suppose. The heart of it all. Yeah, that's it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the heart of it, yeah. Yeah, what are the special features of the 
of, of Brimberian in this, this area? So um, Brimberian is sort of right smack bang in the middle of um, lots of archaeological sites. Um, it's surrounded obviously by the hills, but it's also got ancient woodlands um, and sort of um, lots of um, canes and so on, and lots of fantastic walks. Uh, like you're spoilt for choice of different walks that you could go on, um, and I think it's that um, that farming heritage that I'm sort of so closely related to. Um, in that in the Brimberian area that is also makes it so sort of special to me, I would say. Great. So, what was it like when you were growing up in the Priscilla? So, not, you lived in a few communities, but what was it like in the Priscilla when you were growing up? Um, yeah, so I went to um, Hermon Primary School, mm-hmm. it's called Hermon, which has um, it's closed since I was there uh, quite a few years ago now. Um, and yeah, it was. There was lots of school activities that went on, and all the schools back when I was growing up were um, they were very small schools, most of them. Um, so they had their sort of quite strong little sort of village identities then, I suppose. Um, and I think um, the schools felt like sort of more uh, family-like sort of institutions than sort of larger. Um, some of the larger schools, perhaps, that we, we have in the area now. Great. And roughly, when, when was this? this is, what, what sort of years were brought? So, um, in between, say, the early 90s to, to um, yeah, yeah, to, yeah, the 90s, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, it was, I think it was the year 2000, exactly, when I <coughs> went to a school of Priscilla, then, the, the secondary school in Cremech. Great. Were there um, any sort of people, personalities um, locally that kind of you were aware of when you were growing up, when you were younger, that were sort of synonymous with the area or with those communities where you were growing up? What were they like? Who were they? Yeah, so um, I think my great aunt Jenny was probably not only known in Brimberian as sort of the matriarch of the area, but she was well known uh, across the Braselli and in other areas of Wales as being sort of synonymous with that area. Uh, so she was um, born and bred in Brimberian. Um, she didn't have any children. She had a husband called Eddie, um, and they ran a small holding together. Um, but she was also very, very active in the social sort of constructs of the Priscilla, um, involved in all of the Estedfords, in the chapel going. Uh, she was instrumental in um, getting the community purchase of... Um, a school Llunhirion in Brimberian, which is now the community centre back in the 70s. Um, and she was just sort of a larger-than-life character, even though she was... I don't know what her official height was, but she was a very, very small woman. Um, one of her favourite sayings was when her height was commented on, uh, was she'd say, well, the work is on the floor, as if she was, you know, built for the work. And um, <clears throat> for me, um, it was really interesting because a lot of people would maybe only see her when she was dressed up to the nines, ready to go to chapel or the Estedford or whatever, and she'd have matching trouser suits and would be, you know, flawless, really, with these little heels and so on. Uh, but then I'd go down to the farm and she'd be in her oil skins, wellies, you know, she'd really get stuck into the farming side of things. So she was, um, yeah, a real, real rural character. And I think for uh, women in the area, um, you know, within the time period that she was alive um she's probably quite inspirational because she was a very strong uh, female character great great were there uh, any anybody else any other personalities come to mind um no one that comes like straight to mind that's as i said she's i suppose has um been the backdrop of that area the Priscilla area to me um, I'm sure there are lots of others uh, maybe i'll mention them later <laughs> if, if i get reminded of them um, you mentioned that <coughs> your parents had a bed and breakfast at B and B. My grandparents. Your grandparents, and that's yeah. Where, but that's where where you were living when you were first. Yeah, yeah. Was that common? with the lots of people um, have accommodation like that? Um, I'm not sure. Um, so my um, my grandparents that had the bed and breakfast, um, they moved down to Shropshire. So those are my um, mum's uh, parents. So they moved down to Shropshire when my mum was a teenager. So that was their first business. So they they bought 
uh, a farm um, and they they opened a bed and breakfast there. Um, I think... Um, I think more bed and breakfasts used to exist in the area than they do now. Uh, I think that more guest house approach to welcoming visitors was maybe uh, more of a thing. I feel like maybe lots of bed and breakfasts have closed over recent years, and not just in the Purcelli area, but in other areas in Pembrokeshire. And I think maybe the accommodation offer is more the self-catering sort of style of things Mm -hmm. now, perhaps. Mm-hmm. Well, do you remember what sort of people would use the bed and breakfast? Would it be tourists visiting, or would it be sort of people, work, people who are working in the area using it as temporary accommodation? Lots of um, tourists visiting, um, and um, quite a few of them would develop quite close relationships with my grandparents. Um, so there was one couple in particular that um, I think they were from Bristol, and I think they eventually uh, moved down here, but. Um, when I was a toddler, they developed a special relationship with me and they used to send me gifts and things and they used to come down and stay often. So I think um, that sort of approach, obviously, you develop close relationships with these visitors coming down. And I think it was main, mainly tourists and visitors rather than maybe people working and coming there, I, I suppose. Um, when you're growing up, do you remember what other sorts of work, what other sort of role, roles local people did in the area? What, what, what was sort of the, uh, employment? What, what, what were people employed doing? So um, pretty much all of my family are um, from farming backgrounds, so my mother's side and my father's side. So that's probably the main uh, influence on my perception of, <laughs> of work in the area. Um, I think that used to be... Um, more farm workers and more sort of rural workers um, because obviously there was less mechanisation and so on Um, and so you'd need more hands on deck on these farms. I think now uh, a combination of there being uh, you know machines that can do some of this work uh, and also the fact that um, farms can't afford to employ uh, lots of these um, farm hands basically um, and maybe not only just farm workers, but sort of all the associated roles to do with um, rural life and agriculture that maybe have disappeared. So, you know, like um, hedge laying perhaps and the, the maybe the dry stone walling aspects and so on that maybe I'm not as familiar with, uh, but I'm sure existed far more than they do now, which kind of they're almost like dying crafts now, I would say. There's, they're, they're not, they're not um, done very often in the area as far as I'm aware. Mm-hmm. And I suppose possibly there's a lot of ancillary trades, mechanic, mechanical or agricultural yeah, exactly. that feed into yeah, it. Yeah. Okay. Um, can you remember what sort of how how what people's social lives were like when you were growing up when you were younger? So I think again most of my social life probably revolved around the farming aspect of things because my mother and father didn't really have time to attend lots of big sort of social community events, but. Um, I was involved heavily with um, chapel and Sunday school growing up. So there was a lot of events uh, associated with those then. So um, aside from just kind of going to Sunday school often, um, we would have, um, you know, sort of services and so on. And Kaman Vagani, so like this big sort of singing festival uh, in the chapel, um, you know, and we'd have like a nativity and so on. So there'd be lots of events through the year that you would come together in the chapel um, and, yeah, you, you know, basically be doing readings or singing or performing in some capacity. Um, <clears throat> but there were lots of other social events that we would go to through uh, school things too. Um, there was obviously um, YFC activities and things that we would um, attend occasionally. Um yeah, I think, you know, yeah, generally sort of quite local activities. They were very sort of localised. You wouldn't travel far to get to them. Mm-hmm. So were you a member of the YFC, the Young Farmers Club? I was for a little while growing up, yes. I wasn't like a, a diehard member, I would say. Um, no, not not when I was growing up. But I did go to, um, I think it was um, when Hermon um, Club sort of just sort of because Hermon Club nowadays is it's a big club and they're very very successful, 
Um, but I think I started attending when they had just sort of um, started up again. I think they had like a big hiatus, I suppose, in when maybe they, their YFC used to be very well attended. And then I think it was maybe in the late 90s or early 2000s where they sort of, um, a few volunteers decided to start it up again. So I think I was attending when that sort of so began, I suppose. What age, what age would you have been? Um, I sp- suppose like um, maybe 11 to 13 or so on. Okay. Yeah, I think around that age. Okay. <clears throat> Um, what were the big sort of local celebrations or events? Were there any local um, festivals, events, activities that would you get involved in when in your in your younger life, or that the family would be involved with? So the the Estethfords were quite a big uh, part of um, the year, I suppose. Aside from the um, the sort of era of the Estethfords that you would attend through school. Um, there would also be sort of um, local Stedford. So um, in Brimberian, there was a uh, Stedford held annually and it still is held annually. Um, and I suppose because of my aunt Jenny, um, you would be very much encouraged to attend and she would coach you in all of the reciting and so on. So that was always a big thing. Um, there's also a horticultural show um, that is held annually in Brimberian and that was always held in August and it's, it's still held now um, so you'd always maybe um, you'd uh, sort of put together some craft sort of things that you that you, to, to enter or some photography or um, some poetry um, aside from I wasn't growing the vegetables to enter and the flowers. Obviously, I was too young to do that. But all of the children's sort of competitions. Um, and then they'd normally have some fun competitions on the day. So they had, like, or the best clown or something, because there's lots of photographs of us dressed as, like, crazy clowns. Um, or you'd have, like, a pet show, basically, uh, which would normally involve us just sort of grabbing any sort of working dog off the farm whether it was used to being led or not and sort of just entering it in the show and everyone would be doing the same, basically grabbing grabbing the working dog off the yard and, um, yeah, you'd have this sort of informal pet show as part of the horticultural show. So, yeah, a real sort of community event, I suppose. Um, The only other events that we would go to that were maybe outside the Priscilla area um, uh, were some of the... Um, agricultural shows, the sort of um, local ones, then sort of um, the county show, Haverford West show. Um, I think the only one that we'd attend sort of within the Priscilla year would be um, Nevin show. Um, and that was when we, it's moved quite a few times now um, because the original location <coughs> in Nevin um, was susceptible to a lot of flooding. So the the, the fields weren't they didn't become suitable um, for holding the show there. So we used to go there a lot and um, my father and uncle would enter their cattle and so on um, into some of the competitions, some of the classes. So, um, yeah, it's things like that, I suppose. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so in terms of the Estethford, the local Estethford, so for people that don't know what an Estethford is, how, what would you describe? Obviously there's a national Estethford, which is much bigger in scale yeah. than those locals. How would you describe what an aesthetic is and so, how the difference between the national and the local? So the local ones are sort of a, a, a very sort of small scale version of the large ones. They all have sort of key components. So they're, they're sort of cultural celebration, I suppose. But they all have these sort of competitions within them or these classes. So you have um, you have a range of sort of singing uh, competitions for different age groups so you'd, they'd all have like a you know you'd have a, a specific song that you would learn um, so there'd be singing but there'd also be choral competitions you'd have like acting parties or like care dance so you'd do like a mixture of singing and acting those sorts of groups and they would be judged against each other um, then you would have um, reciting then adroz um, so you'd have those across the ages into into adults as well. So not just children; it would go into sort of adults, um, and then you would also have um, uh, sort of written um, sort of poem, poetry, literature sort of competitions, and then you would have uh, the cheering of a of 
of, a, of the beard then basically of you know um of the a gada and so the you know so they would win a chair then either a mini one or a full scale one so they would um be writing a, a poem on a certain subject um and i think this I think it's quite flexible in terms of writing in different styles, but um, I think a lot of obviously the the um, Welsh poets locally would write in kanghanes, uh, so specific sort of Welsh meters of, of verse and rhyme, um, and yeah, they would have a ceremony then if when they when they won, um, and they would be cheered then, um, yeah. So that it's a it's a sort of a it usually starts in the afternoon, say the Brimberry on one, and can go into the get you know, can go on very late, depending on how many competitors there are. So, um, and some people do get very competitive. Some people take a light-hearted approach, but um, yeah, but it's a it's a fantastic showcase really of of Welsh talent, I suppose, um, in that cultural context. Because there are all, all the. Singing the poetry of the cyclists is all through the medium of Welsh. It's all very Welsh. It's all Welsh, yeah. The Welsh language, yeah, yeah, it's all Welsh. So um, that's the key component of it all, really. Um, Yeah, and it and as said they still go on now. And as you said, there are the national Stethfords then that you will have very similar competitions, but obviously in a much larger format, and um, you may have other competitions within those obviously because they're larger events so you might have more musical instruments involved or clog dancing or you know there's all manner of, of different sort of cultural um, sort of competitions within that then. Great. You mentioned earlier school, you went to school obviously mm. um, in Hermon yeah. before going on to a school of Yeah. Uh, what was school like particularly that, um, at Hermon, that small village school? What would, what what were the sort of what are your memories of that? What would the school day have been like? What was what sort of things did you do? So, um, as I said earlier, the school Harriman was a you know it, it was closed sadly after I left. Um, it was classed as being not well attended for its size. However, when it was closed, uh, it had a good uh, fifty or so children in it, which was uh, it was at capacity really, and it had other children that would have come to attend it afterwards. Um, so it was a very sort of family like atmosphere in the school. Sort of everyone knew each other. Um, you would own, there was only two classes, so you'd have a, a class for the sort of um, the younger children. So it's from years say, um, oh, from sort of Dosbach Derby, and so the sort of the incomers from the nursery school up until. Oh, year two or three, and then you had like a, another class. Then was from the years like three until six or something um so yeah the, you know you would be learning across the ages there would be a sort of an um i wouldn't say intergenerational but you would have all of these different ages within one class so you wouldn't be just in in your own year then class learning um we did a lot of uh sort of work within the community so you'd always be going out into the village to do things and um, down into some of the nature walks and so on. So we had, you know, very sort of cultural uh, sort of style of of learning about the world um, in the school had them on. Um, and yeah, lots of close knit friends and so on, really. So um, yeah, it was a fantastic school um, and said it was a shame, really, because I feel that these larger schools, maybe children haven't got the same... Uh, opportunities perhaps because we'd always all of us have the opportunity to be entered into the year of the Stethfords and so on um, you know there wouldn't be like a big lot of competition at all okay well you're not good enough so you can't enter we all had an opportunity so I think um, yeah it was a uh, it was great yeah good um, are there any, in terms of your school days is there anything that sort of really stands out to you anything particular that any particular recollections you have um we generally did so many so many good things really like you know there's there's so many little memories within just sort of between my schoolmates or um you know going back to the Estetford there was one year where there was a party in sign so sort of a one you you part a unison party so you had to sing in one tune or try to anyway 
um, and we actually went up to the um, Estedford Genedlaethol, so the so the the big Estedford. So I think we went up to Conroy, I think that year the Estedford was at. Uh, so we did actually because there's a few of these sort of um, heats basically, so that you're not guaranteed to to actually sing on the main stage in the Estedford. You've got to do these little kind of knockout. Uh, sort of um, competitions first within that main competition um, but yeah we managed to get the stage so that was uh, very prestigious uh, for a small school in Hermon so that was um, yeah that was a great experience um, it was um, Jill Lewis um, who was she was our conductress then um, I think she must have had patience of a saint um, because she did have to keep reminding us that we would sing as one uh, because obviously we'd had the tendency to really sing out, you know, and so um, yeah, no, it, 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 that was that was a, a great memory, I suppose, um, that we managed to get that far um, from such a small school, I suppose. Great. Um, what kind of activities did you get involved with outside of school when you were growing up? Um, There was a bit of, you know, you'd do some violin lessons or piano lessons or something like that. Not that you perhaps would keep them up, not in my, not in, in my case anyway. Um, but I would do, uh, when I was younger, I did a lot of horse riding. Uh, so I did a little pony. So I would go to the odd show jumping um, or the odd sort of um, little show or something. So I had yeah, a Welsh mountain pony and he was quite smart. And so I would... Um, yeah, take him to different things. Whether I would stay on was another question. But um, yeah, so th- I did a lot of horse riding then. That was something I did a lot of, I suppose, when I was younger. Um, yeah. And was that common? Did a lot of people do that sort of thing? What were, what were other young people doing outside of school? Um, not everybody, no. Um, my um, mother's side of the family have always been involved with horses. Um, so when my grandfather moved down here, um, Doug Jennings, um, he brought down uh, shires with him. So he'd previously been working with shires and they were very used to using uh, horses and a carriage and things like that. And so my mother's second nature was horses really. So it was, um, I think it was inevitable that um, us children would be thrust upon the back of something. Like that is my earliest memory as being thrust upon the top of a shy horse whether I was complicit in it or not I don't know but that's my first memory anyway um so yeah I don't think everybody did um but I went for um I went for riding lessons in um David uh, riding school in Bridell uh with Ninu and Terence so I went there for quite a few years and um I wouldn't just be riding my own pony paddy then I'd be riding some of their ponies as well and so on um you know there's a few pony club things um yeah so I don't think everyone did it but um yeah it was one of my pastimes I suppose great okay um so you went to Hedemont school and then when you went to secondary school that was at uh, the school for Sally in Crimmach yes and that was in about the year 2000 yeah um anything stand out from secondary school for you what was your experience of secondary school like um, you know, teenage years are very turbulent, aren't they? So, um, you know, yes, generally good experiences, um, some fantastic teachers there, um, probably my favourite teachers, probably as well as my friend would be, um, Mrs Mary Lloyd, who was my history teacher. Um, I had a bit of a step up as I was getting there though, because my father was teacher's pet when he was in school with her. Um, I was told that she's got a son called Reese as well, and my father's called Reese. And I was told that she named a son after my father, but I don't know if that's true or not. But anyway, um, I had a very close relationship with her throughout uh, secondary school. Um, and she was a larger than life character, uh, everyone will tell you. Um, you know, she'd be the type of teacher that, you know, if she lost the temper, she'd throw the pencil case across the room. Um, but it would be in good humour. Um, <laughs> and lots of funny stories about her. Um, so, yeah, we I spent a lot of time with her um, in and out of lessons, to be honest. Um, she sadly passed away a few years ago now. 
and she was the um, the wife of the the head teacher at the time, uh, Mr. Martin Lloyd, as well. Uh, be a very special person. So I'd say that, um, yeah, that some of the teachers they were definitely you know they don't make them like that these days. Basically, <laughs> <clears throat> do you think that life at that sort of rural secondary school at that time would have been different to schools elsewhere, perhaps in or perhaps in more urban areas or elsewhere? Do you think? Yes, perhaps, like, a school of Priscelli has always been known um, for its Welshness um, above anything else. Um, some people don't like that, um, but I think it has been a part of um, their continuing success as a school, um, you know, in comparison to other schools. Um, I think it's very recently been awarded the best school in Wales, if not one of the best in the UK again, and I know it's been on those lists for years and years. Um, so, yeah, I think back even back when I was in school, um, I think uh, that set it aside from other schools. Uh, there's more Welsh schools available now um, in this day and age, whereas there wasn't as many Welsh schools um, in when I was growing up, I don't think. There were children that were travelling up from the south of the county, from Milford Haven and so on, and spending at least an hour on the bus to get to school. Uh, which was interesting, I suppose, because um, the school then wasn't just made up of the local villages. Um, you know, you were getting influx of people from, as I said, south of the county or even further past Cardigan Way and so on. You know, to people were were coming from a long way to attend. Correct. Um, when you left school, what did you do then? So I did go to university to begin with, um, to Cardiff University to, to study uh, history and sociology, um, but I didn't last very long there. Um, it, the university experience didn't suit me at the time. Um, I probably could have done with going into sort of a work experience placement or having a year out or something at the time. As I said, teenage years were extremely turbulent. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, so... Um... So what, so what did you do then? You came back to... Uh, I came I came back um, to live at home, uh, so in San Bernard on the farm. Um, and then I worked for about four years as a supervisor in J.K. Lewis in Crimich. Um So I used to say the only thing that I don't do here is bake the bread. Uh, but you would see me um, rushing around like a headless chicken doing everything else. So... Uh, J.K. Lewis is a very long-established bakery and convenience store in Crimich, right opposite uh, the secondary school, um, uh, School of Priscelli. And it was a very busy shop, um, obviously, aside from the fact that it being opposite the school, obviously, it was in a prime location for people, you know, calling in anyway. Um, But it was also supply... Uh, sort of baked goods, bakery items to most of Pembrokeshire, uh, different shops and uh, so on. Um, so yeah, it was a it it was a very busy place, um, and it's one of those places whereby when you work in JK, um, I had a lot of people uh, look down on me for working there, basically because oh well you know you're right opposite the school, you haven't got very far in your life, sort of thing. Uh, but actually, um, I learned so much there about the world of work, about people, about local people. Um, you know, you'd hear everything in there uh, about local, the local area or meet lots of characters from different walks of life from all over the communities. And you weren't, it wasn't like working in a typical retail role there. Um, you know, you were expected to have a chat to people. You know, you were kind of a shoulder to cry on sometimes as well. So, yeah, it was, um, you know, as much as people would, as I said, certain people would look down on you as if, you know, why are you working here? Um, I enjoyed it and I, I took a lot from it. And uh, maybe some people maybe wouldn't have embraced it the way I had. Maybe I was just throwing myself into every different facet of the, the company. But, um, yeah, no, there was... You know, I had a I had a lot of great days there, and there's some great colleagues that I worked with at the time. Okay, so you were there for about four years. About four years, yeah. And is the bakery still there today? 
Yeah, it's still there. And, still there. And it's still sort of operating in the same way as it was when you were working there? Yeah, pretty much. If I call in there, it's madness in there. So I assume it's it's still as busy as it was when I was working there. Um, whenever I go in there, they try and get me to come back and work there. Oh, really? <laughs> um, and that was many years ago now. But um, yeah, it's it's sort of a... You know, everyone knows JK's, basically. It's well known in the local area, not just in Crimich, but further afield. Um, and it's um, it was run uh, years ago uh, by uh, Keith Lewis, um, who then sold it on to um, Carwin and Shan. And uh, so it's always been that very Welsh family-run sort of uh, business, I suppose. Were there any sort of local specialities or delicacies? Um, well, you know, you could have a bacon roll from JK, then that was probably a big thing. Uh, they had lots of pasties and things like that, so people would come in for their specialities, or, you know, you'd have, have the old dears come in for, um, you know, a small loaf, a small white loaf, had to be a white one, and they had to double check, even though they came in and bought it every day, you'd think that they would know what it looked like, but it had to be sure it was a white loaf. Brown wasn't up to scratch. Uh, so you'd have, you'd, a lot of the time, you'd be a personal shopper to some of these people because you'd know exactly what they're going to put. You could, as soon as they came into the shop, you could have literally just gone round with a basket and gone, there you go. Um, you know, because you know exactly what they were after. Um, so, um, yeah, the, the, some people would come a long way for the bread and um, some of them liked it very black on the top. Or some of them liked it, there was barely baked at all. So you got to know everyone's uh, baked good preferences, I suppose. <laughs> Brilliant. What did you What did you do next? So next, um, I suppose this is when um, I met my long term partner Brian. Or I had known him before, but um, I actually moved down out to the Pacelli area for um, I know and heard of uh, for about a year and a half. Um, so I lived in Milford Haven because that's where uh, he is from, although his family are from Carmarthen, but um, that's where he grew up. So I lived there for a while. And then I was a manager of a clothes shop in Haverford West for almost two years, I think. Uh, so a shop that was selling lots of occasion wear, um, uh, wedding outfits and so on. So again, very high customer service um and uh, yeah you, you bought a personal shopper sort of experience um what was funny in that position was is that um i would usually i'm the type of person that will greet everyone in welsh whether they're welsh or not um you know that's what i normally do welsh first and so you'd have people come in and um as soon as they realized that you're a welsh speaker they bought everything in the shop with me <laughs> Uh, it was like, you know, they was they related to you on a completely different level. And when I eventually left the role, um, my old colleagues would say that people would come in, ask for me, oh, where's the Welsh lady? Um, and when they realised I wasn't there, they'd turn and walk out the shop. Um, so it was just interesting that uh, even in that sort of role, I could, you know, bring in that sort of cultural element of um, engaging pe- with people in the Welsh language as well, I suppose. Right. <clears throat> Uh, and and then after that, did you move out of, away from retail after that? Yes, uh, I did. Um, so um, me and Brian uh, at the time we realised that we, it was pretty unsustainable for us to be uh, renting a flat in Milford Haven, um, and you know we weren't able to save much money towards maybe getting a deposit for a house and so on. Um, so at the time, my um, my mangi, my grandmother, who um, had gone to live in my uncle's old house, her house um, became available to live in. Um, so we moved back up then to Brimberian, um to live in that house, but to also start the crazy idea of putting a yurt up in the field. Uh, so um, we had a few... A few lovely years there, to be honest. Um, and if I could have could have done, I would have carried on living in Brimberian. So I think we spent about five years there, almost six, I think. Um, so um, 
yeah, completely different different experience to my partner Brian, who'd only been used to living in the south of the county, uh, in the down belows, as they like to say when they refer to him. Um, yeah, so, and then I went in, so when I moved then here, um, I think I spent a few months uh, on this youth project that we'd undertaken. And then this role came up then in St. Dogmills, and I read it and I went, oh, that's my dream role. <laughs> I'm never going to get it, but I'll try it anyway. It and I think it was in the Tyvee side. So, um, it was uh, to work on something called the People's Orchard Project, was, which was a, a lottery-funded uh, environmental and community project. So even though my background wasn't in uh, anything entirely environmental, I had done a lot of stuff on geography and things in my A-levels and stuff. And it had always been, aside from me doing the history aspect of things, I was more drawn to doing things with the environment and nature and the outdoors somehow. Uh, if I could have gone back and done something different in school, I probably would have done. But, um, you know, hindsight's a wonderful thing. Anyway, so I applied for this job then, and I got it. Um, so I worked for three years then, um, or a little bit more than that, in St. Dogmores, um, and worked with a lady called Nia Siggins, who became my very good friend at the time as well and we yeah we had a, a great great experience there really um planting I think over 2,000 apple trees in an area where you know it's just outside the Purcell area St Dogmores but um would have been naturally um covered in apple trees because of the abbey there and the monks and so on so um helping pollinators but also restore some of the local heritage I suppose. I was going to say that's where you started getting doing more work with kind of local traditions and local heritage, you started to do more... And more community work, yeah, definitely, yeah. yeah. So that's where I sort of started that off, I suppose. And um, Working with my colleague Nia, um, well, you know, <laughs> she's a character in her own right, but to work with someone like Nia, she has every faith that you can do anything in the world. Um, she, she'll she literally give you the reins and say, let's go, you know. she, you know, she, Any idea we had... And the, the project we had, we were very lucky. We had that flexibility and um, the community in St. Dogman was very, very keen. So, we, yeah, we, we, yeah, it was great, really. We, if I could have done that project forever, I would have done, because it was the best. Great. Um, do you think your kind of, your career path is like, typical of people your age? Did, that, did a lot of people do that sort of thing? No. <laughs> Probably not at all. Um, I think, um, ideally, when I was younger, I would have been a farmer. That's what I wanted to do. That's why I wanted to, I wanted to go into farming. Um, obviously, close to animals and so on have been since I've been uh, a baby. Um, but my father wasn't keen on me and my sister um, uh, going into anything agricultural uh, because he believed that we wouldn't make any money out of it um, <clears throat> although I've always argued with him well it's not always about the money dad um, so I think if I'd have start, if, if I could have had the choice that's what I would have done is I would have uh, got into sort of agriculture um, really ideally so I think um, but that's not that's not what a lot of uh, girls my age did either so maybe it's more common now that more females are going into agriculture um, I'd say a lot of people my age went through the university route of things, um, but uh, but sort of even though I didn't finish university, a lot of them have either had similar jobs to me eventually, or maybe they're doing something completely different. So, because um, that's the issue I always had with my job, my my university courses, I could never see what was next. I think that uncertainty, I didn't know where I was going. And I think obviously a lot of people have that growing up where they don't know where they're going, I suppose. And I suppose this area, you've got limited opportunities being in a rural area. Um, so I, I think a lot of people my age probably went into the teaching side of things. They became teachers or something. Um, that's where I said I, a lot of my old school friends, I think, have, have gone into do you think it's common for people to go into sort of the family business? 
Yeah, I would say so. There are, again, a, a few of my friends have, have taken the reins from their parents, and um, so um, my uh, in the school had um, My in my year, then my best from, friend was probably Sean Reese Midway um, from Midway Motors Bus Company. I think it was always known that Sean was probably going to inherit that business and take it on, which he has done. But he's also uh, a local councillor now as well. Um, he's he's had that role recently. Um, so yes, there's a lot of people that would have um, been take. You know that was their that was their route. Um, would be taking on the family business then. Uh, whether that would be as said something like a bus company or farming or or lidge or you know um, lots of different sort of these yeah sort of small businesses. Okay, so. You originally went away to university and then came back again. Did, did, did other people your age, did they leave to go to university and did they stay away or did, or they, did they come back again? Um, yes, there was a lot of people that did go, go to university, but there was a lot of people that didn't. Um, I think um, a lot of my friends did. Um, I... Um, I wouldn't say I was a SWAT in school, but I was like on maybe the higher level. So I'd say a lot of people would have naturally gone to university, and um, with no disrespect to Scott Baselli, they they wanted you to go in that direction, whether it really suited you or not. And in my case, it didn't suit me. I could have done with a different route in, I would say. Um, but um, yeah, I think uh, yeah, other people maybe did other things. Um, what was the rest of the question? I think I've did people, deviated. Did people who left, did they come back? Did people... Oh, um, some have, yeah, some have. Um, I think the, the main struggle for a lot of people has been um, the housing issue that has become more apparent in the last, I would say, five to ten years. Um, uh, the housing situation in the rural areas is... is you know, there's there's not an awful lot of opportunity for people to get on the housing area, a housing ladder, sorry. Um, so, and for some of maybe the job roles that they've pursued through university, those jobs don't exist in rural areas. So, um, they've had to go and work in Cardiff or further afield, I suppose. Uh, I think some people have managed to come back um, following, maybe working away and maybe found... Uh, another role with transferable skills that they could get into locally um, but yes it's you know yeah it, it I think it's becoming more of a problem again now I think a lot of people won't be able to come back even if they wanted to um, because the jobs are not here perhaps okay um, a slightly different aspect of I suppose your earlier life here is about um broader social life and community life. Um, what sort of services, facilities were there in the, available in the area do you think, um, and how do you think it compared to, to other areas? So you're saying sort of shops and things like yeah, that? Yeah, I guess shops, businesses, things you could do, amenities. Um... I think there was a lot uh, more sort of local shops. Um, uh, I think a lot of the sort of smaller, smaller rural businesses have uh, closed um, because there's been competition from obviously people just going, well, I can, I can go and get that in 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 town or something. I don't need to go to this small shop with this maybe a little bit more expensive and so on. Um, you know, we are lucky that we still got some great butchers and so on in the local area, um, but I think maybe some of uh, but I feel like some of the local businesses that I'm talking about may be pre my time as well. They're just sort of in my memory because other people have said, or, you know, there used to be a chap in Brimbarian that used to sell anything you wanted, basically. You'd go into his front room and he'd have wellies, he'd have bikes, he'd have anything, basically. And if you wanted it, he'd get it for you. Um, I didn't go there, but that's in my memory because other people have said that that sort of shop existed, like some sort of Aladdin's cave or something. Um, but yeah, I, I think there are lots of maybe smaller businesses um, that maybe, I, I can't name them, but I'm aware that they don't exist anymore. Mm-hmm. 
What do you think has affected that? Well, there's there's sort of um, larger chains. Um, so I suppose what I haven't mentioned there is pubs. Um, there's a lot of pubs that would have existed in the local area. You know, people like to drink and they don't like to go too far to do it normally. Um, but <laughs> uh, obviously people's um, habits have changed over time. Uh, it's not sustainable to, to run these small rural pubs. Uh, and you know there's a lot of chain pubs and restaurants that have maybe come into the area uh, we have been lucky that there's a couple of local pubs that have been able to be saved through community ownership uh, so you know Tavan Sink is, is a key example there of a community owned pub in the Presali area and very historical one at that but um, you know without that community sort of led ownership of it um, it would have probably closed. So in terms of kind of those shops and businesses that you've mentioned, can you remember within your lifetime a significant decline in the number of pubs and shops? There are lots of pubs closed that you can remember in the local area, lots of shops closed down in the local area? Um, yeah, so there's, so when we were in Hermon, there used to be a, um, a, a shop and post office there that closed within my time in the school there. Um, growing up in Brimbarian as well, there used to be a shop and post office uh, in the village. Um, I remember going as a child, there was a chap called Dobbin there, that lots of tattoos at the time, which was, for, for me, I hadn't seen that many tattoos at the time, so it was quite a, a spectacle. And he used to um, yeah, run the shop and the post office, and then that sort of... Decline. So the sort of these very small rural shops uh, that were just sort of selling newspapers and sweets and you know milk, bread, the very basics. There was also a shop in Glandur actually, so near Llanvernach, uh, where the farm was. Um, again, that one closed within my lifetime. So there's three small rural shops there within when I was growing up then. Um, so. Um, yeah, those are three that, that I'm aware of in my very local area, but I'm sure there are lots and lots more. I think there used to be one in Egasuru as well, in the village. Um, yeah, I think... Um, and also they may be selling cigarettes and so on as well, and you know people maybe smoke less now and things as well, so there's no need for them to go to these small shops. People read news on their, on their mobile devices, they don't need to buy a newspaper. Yeah. Okay, so that brings us on to the questions around the present day. Um, what is it like to live in the Preseli area today? What's life like here today? So, you know, generally, um, how old am I now? 34, I suppose. Um, you know, I'd like to do a lot of walking in the local area, things like that. I'm probably more acutely aware of um, my cultural identity in this place um, than I was um, growing up. It was sort of just, you know, when you're growing up, there's lots of other things going on. I suppose you don't realise how important it is. Um, the area has changed an awful lot uh, in terms of... Um, the Welshness of it, I suppose. Um, you know, growing up, there was a lot more Welsh spoken, um, and I think now there's, there has been a lot more um, incomers that have come in, um, and there's always been incomers to Prasadi communities. Um, I think what has been noticeable is, though, is that um, the people that moved in 30, 40 years ago had to make a huge effort to ingratiate themselves, whether they learn the language or not, into the local community and have and do have that huge respect for the language and the traditions, the place names and so on. Um, you know, that it, it's yeah, they, they just they just do. You know, I was speaking to a lady the other day and even though she's not fluent Welsh, she makes sure she pronounces everything correctly and she asks me about Welsh words and she's uh, she's just got that innate understanding of the culture. Um, 
whereas I think a lot of income is now. We've had a lot in the last few years um, since the house prices have, have risen out of reach of local people. And um, I don't think they've, not that it's their individual fault, but they, they haven't had to um, ingratiate themselves into the Welsh community uh, because there's such a large proportion of them as incomers and they've almost created their own community within our communities, I suppose. So that's uh, kind of what it's like now. It's, it's very different in that regard um, to how it would have been. You know, it would have been that Welsh was prevalent. And even though in Pembrokeshire, the Bruxelles area is still regarded as uh, the, the the Welsh stronghold, really, within a county that, you know, is uh, very unfondly by some known as Little England beyond Wales. Um, yeah, it's it, this is, there's a huge change that has, has been happening in the area, I think, and the local census... Uh, or recent census results of the local areas sort of test to the changes in the Welsh language as well, I would say. So, um, obviously, there's a, there's a change in demographics locally. Um, and we've talked a little bit about how businesses and the facilities available have also evolved over time and reflect perhaps changing attitudes and changing means of getting hold of things. Um, how has sort of social lives been affected by, um, or how are social lives different today? So, um, you know, it's very difficult not to mention COVID-19 really, because that has changed things from what it used to be from a few years ago, you know. Um, I think people... Uh, a lot more sort of cautious about coming to some social social events now. Um, I'd say that uh, generally um, it's difficult to run social events uh, without it maybe turning to being an English event, even if you put, uh, plan for it to be Welsh, you know. Because everyone just switches to English if if not everyone understands Welsh, um, so yeah, I don't know how different social events are though. Otherwise, there's lots of traditional events that still happen, and um, non-Welsh speakers do get involved in them. You know, and they're a great they're a great way of them learning more about the culture. So um, you know, the local Stedfords, a lot of non-Welsh speakers attend purely because they really get that. Um, that real sense of the culture then uh, even if they don't understand the language fluently um, I don't know if I've answered that question really <laughs> what sort of yeah what sort of um, social activities you've obviously apart from the aesthetics that we've sort of mentioned what other sort of social activities or events happen locally um, what now yeah I feel like now there's a lot more of a um there's a lot of events uh, that are run these days that are very much like wellness events that maybe they wouldn't have been delivered years and years ago. Like even like yoga and things, you know, that, that you know, maybe a keep fit class would have been, you know, just aerobics or something, you know. Whereas yoga, obviously, that's very common now in Pembrokeshire, Brasal area and across the UK, obviously. Um, you know, there's, there's at least, no, there's two yoga teachers just live in Brimberia um, and you know there's lots of these very sort of wellness focused social events I feel that uh, yeah weren't so much of a thing I don't think growing up unless I just wasn't entirely aware of them uh, I think we have had a lot of people come to live here because of you know what they deem the healing power of the landscape uh, they have set up sort of a wellness sort of businesses then around the Preseli area because of, um, yeah, as I said, the, that sort of healing aspect of the, the landscape and, you know, the beauty of it and, you know, the, 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 the nature of it, I suppose. Okay, what sort of activities do you get involved with? What sort of things do you do? 
outside of work, yeah. away from work, away from home. So, <laughs> um, I feel like I do so many social activities with work that actually, in my own time, I don't do an awful lot of them. Um, I've got three border collies, uh, so I like to do a lot of walking normally, uh, obviously every day. Um, most of which is in the Pasadi area. So that take, that's, that's my main... And it's not very social, I've got to say. <laughs> uh, you know, I do take people along with me sometimes. I like to go out for uh, food locally. I like to uh, go in ca- to cafes, coffee shops or whatever. I do enjoy doing all of that. Um, I, a lot of the events, as I said, that I get involved with, may some of them in Brimberian, which are the Estead for the Horticultural Show and so on, I'm involved with them, but I'm also involved with them through work. So it, it, I can't just sort of say, well, I'm, I'm involved, you know, I'm just attending them as a attendee only, I suppose. Okay. So, um, and I, I do like to go to some live music events and so on, you know, if, if we can manage. Um, but sometimes we travel further afield for those. Sometimes we don't, you know, growing up, I think there were more local music events uh, sort of in, you know, maybe local towns from not in the Pasadena area, but say Hanford West and so on. There aren't as many now. Um, so maybe you've got to travel further afield for those sorts of events, perhaps. Is that because of COVID or is that a sort of a trend that's happening with that kind of thing? I don't think it's COVID. I think it's just, yeah, just the trend of things. And it's going, going along with uh, the pub closures, venue closures and so on. You know, people have got different habits of how they entertain themselves. You know, they just watch Netflix or something or, you know, they maybe have a, have a drink at home because it's cheaper rather than going out. You know, there's lots of ways of people engaging with culture that doesn't that can be in their living room I suppose they don't need to go out to enjoy it I suppose yeah. do you think it's also to do with the changing demographics in the area the yes so um, you know there are a lot of people that have moved here to retire now and maybe they don't want to go to all of the uh, you know youth centered music you know, um, I don't think my music taste would be, when I was growing up, would be to the taste of the retired people in the area. So, yeah, that has probably led to the decline of some of these events happening, uh, whether in the Pazali area or outside of it, I suppose. OK. Um, are there still lots, um, sort of, lots of active other sorts of social groups, choirs, sports groups, musical groups, drama groups in the area, what sort of? those things sort of happening yeah so there's an awful lot of, of groups locally you know from Merched Wawr which is sort of the Welsh version of the WI there's WI as well uh, there's lots of, you know Crimmich Rugby Club and other sort of sporting clubs lots of them um, there are lots of small clubs that are associated with some of the community centres um, so I'm currently the coordinator at uh the community centre in Brimberian and we have little groups that meet here whether it be book clubs and so on uh, obviously there's the YFCs uh, across the area that are very very active I think over the last 10 years the YFCs have had a, a big influx of of, uh, of young people attend uh, that aren't just um, farming uh, backgrounds you know they people from all backgrounds um yeah, so there's there's lots of clubs, and I think um, uh, going back to what I was saying about people moving here, um, sometimes I think that uh, it's very hard for them to get involved with those because a lot of them are very Welsh centred activities, um, and maybe they don't realise that the Welsh have got their social um, calendars booked up. Basically, you know, they they can't come to all of the events that are put on that are maybe non-Welsh speaking because they're, they're so busy basically and lots of committees and so on and choirs and yeah, there is, there's lots going on. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, so thinking about kind of when you were being, when you were, when were you being brought up, brought up in the area um, and thinking about the local, the stories, local stories that would have been passed down or told to you sort of around either the local history or local folklore, family history. Um, 
did your did your family have an interest in history or local history? I wouldn't say my family did. No, um, you know. Uh, what I always say about people that are involved in the agricultural agricultural side of the Priscilla area is they're very much so close to their own history by you know working it every day that it's not something that they openly talk about because they're living it. Um, so no, I wouldn't say that they were they were it was something that they were very uh, you know enthusiastic about or keen to pass on to me or anything. It was just. If I learned about it, I learned about it, you know. I suppose my uh, Aunt Jenny that I mentioned earlier, she was she was more hyper aware of these uh, things. Um, uh, she, you know, she would normally take part in um, any sort of celebrations to do with um, the Brudier at Priscilla, the, the Battle of the Priscilla, so she would uh, be up when they were up where the mon- monument stones are on the top of the hill, um, because she was, as a child then, growing up, uh, when there was this threat of closing the hillside uh, because of the army wanting to take it over as a training ground. Uh, that was sort of after the Second World War. So, um, yeah, so, you know, I learned some things through, say, her and maybe a few other um, family friends that are maybe more interested in it. Um we learned an awful lot in school anyway. Uh, I feel that, um, yeah, in the school had one, it was, they were very, um, they were very keen on, on, on us learning about that sort of local history, I suppose, and passing that information to us. Um, were your family, they sort of had an interest in the family history? Did you sort of dad know about the sort of previous generations of the, the family and was that something that was passed down? Um, yes. Um, you know, I'm from a very large family on my father's side. Uh, like, you know, when you're in school, it'd be, be difficult for you not to be related to someone, really, you know. Uh, you know, I didn't... Some people, I've only... You know, when you come across them, say, the other day, and they go, oh, I think we're related, you know. Uh, so the large family. So yeah, you know, that was that knowledge of um, ancestors there in our family and so on. Um, how much say my father spoke about it? You know, I think um, I've learned some of it through other people, maybe that are sort of not my direct family. Then sort of outside the family more. Um, yeah, it's yeah. They, I wouldn't say that they are. They look forward rather than back a lot of the time, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, with that in mind, I suppose, do you know about um, any traditions, um, local traditions that are still sort of in, in, in use or still being pursued in this area? Yeah, so um, the Hain Galan, which is the old uh, New Year, which is... Uh, obviously mainly celebrated in the Cumguain, but um, Brimberian isn't far from Cumguain. So we would also go out and Cani Kalenig, sing Kalenig uh, on uh, New Year's Day, uh, the old New Year uh, as well, during that time. Uh, and we were always aware of Hain Galan growing up. Uh, that was something that, you know, yeah, we were very much aware of. Um, and obviously it's become quite... Uh, not a spectacle, I suppose, but something that uh, people do talk about, um, you know, on a national level, I suppose, not just in in our village square, in our square mile anymore. And I think probably a lot of other local villages that surround Cumguain probably also used to used to take up that tradition as well uh, of going out to sing on on New Year's Day and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think Galan's probably the the main one growing up. I would, I'm aware of, I suppose. Um, so that's Hain Galan is celebrated on the on thirteenth of January. Yes, and that's to to mark the change from the Gregorian to the Julian calendar, isn't that right? Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. You've got it right. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> 
So yeah, so any any other sort of local traditions that are specifically local, or any I suppose even Welsh Welsh kind of traditions that are, that are kind of uh, still held in the local area. Um, or agricultural practices that you're aware of. So, you know, my my father and the the graziers of the Preseli Hills. Um, they take their sheep um, every year uh, in the winter down to graze the uh, military firing range down in Castle Martin uh, near Pembroke down in the south of the county. They do that yearly and have been doing that since I think it's the 60s I think they've been doing it Um, and that is a modern even though it's going back a long time now, it's it's a relatively modern uh, way of um, kind of moving the sheep. Um, it would have been known as Havoda Hendra, so, you know, the, the summer place and the winter place of grazing. So they, so the, so yeah, so the Preseli mountain sheep then, they go down to the Castle Martin to have their lambs in the November uh, so they winter there and they have their lambs in in the spring. Um, the Welsh mountain sheep that uh, the Preseli farmers have um, on the hill are very hardy, so they usually lamb on their own down there with minimal supervision. And then in about May time then, um, all the shepherds of the Preseli would be down in Castle Martin for a, a few weeks then, separating their flocks from each other um, with their lambs in tow, which is quite a big job. It's not as easy. You've got to separate uh, one sheep at a time with the correct lamb off uh, off a flock, basically, and make sure it's your sheep. Uh, so the sheep would then, um, once they'd had the unique earmarks put in, so each farmer's got the unique earmarks that are cut into the ears of the sheep, whether they're a female or a male, uh, the sheep would then be transported back via uh, lorry or horse box or whatever, and would then then be on the hills. The lamb would be separated and weaned then, but the the sheep would go back onto the hills then for the summer then up until the November again. Um, so, for me, that's a huge part of um, the traditional agricultural calendar for Preseli farmers because both sides of the hill so the Brimberian um, and sort of Crimmich side and the Menachlog the sort of side they all are involved in it so lots of farmers um, and you know over the years uh, I mean, it's, it, it's a very fond thing that they do you know it's a lot of work um, but we love going down to Castle Martin it's like a it's just a yeah, it, it's great. I've got lots of memories from being out in, down the range there. I know that's not in the Preseli area, but it's kind of part of that uh, experience of yeah of, of of farming in this this place. I suppose um, I think that the main reason they started doing it back in the sixties uh, was because at one point there was such an awful snowfall. Uh, in the Preseli area that it killed off all the flocks they were digging them out for weeks and they were all dead so they had to replenish their flocks then and they didn't want that to happen again so they were offered then um, these grazing uh, op- this gra- grazing opportunity then down on the military firing range in Castle Martin which is, you know, it's a long way to go uh, but it offers good grazing and so the sheep not only maintain the biodiversity of the hills at the Presali area, but they also maintain the biodiversity of the firing range down in Castle Martin, which again is a very sort of open wilderness sort of area. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a special sort of connection, I suppose, between the north and the south that I don't think, uh, north and south of the county, that maybe pe- some people aren't, aren't aware of. They don't realise that the same sheep that are on the Preselis in the summer are the same sheep that go and graze the the range down in the winter. So um, maybe not a a, a sort of uh, a tradition in the conventional way, but for us it is a tradition. You know, I, you couldn't imagine the year without that uh, taking place. 
Okay, great. Um, are there any sort of traditions linked to celebrations like harvest or Christmas or um, any other sort of midwinter festivals that, are, that happen locally? Um, you know, the, from the chapel sort of side of things, there would be harvest festival and so on. Um, a lot of the chapel events, uh, so over the last twenty years, have probably been becoming less and less well attended. Really, um, you know, I don't go to chapel anymore. I'm an atheist now, uh, but it was a part of my childhood growing up. Um, so yeah there would have been harvest festival events and readings and so on so these things still happen but not everyone in the community takes part perhaps um, how does a Priscelli Christmas differ from a from another uh, other Christmas, what's a, what's a Christmas like in the Priscilla? Um, you know, lots of you know nativity plays and carol singing and stuff like that happens. Um, you know, I know that the Mary Lloyd has had a bit of a resurgence now as a midwinter tradition over the last few years, but it has had a resurgence across Wales. Um, it's not. Um, traditionally associated with the Presali area. Um, I think what would have been more associated with this area is the uh, tradition of Hélar Drew hunting the wren. Um, but you know, of, of course, no one does that these days. It's exceptionally, it's a very cruel uh, sort of concept. Um, but the Mary Lloyd, which is the, you know, the, the sort of horses skull with ribbons and bells and stuff attached kind of visiting pubs and so on for a bit of a punk or rap battle as they like to call it these days that has become far more common um even more so so oh gosh going back say um four more years ago um when i worked on the people's orchard project we did um a bit of a Mary Lloyd uh, set of workshops um, tying in with the wassailing tradition with orchards and so on. And at that time, it, it wasn't that greatly done in Pembrokeshire. And we did a couple of them and it was great and got the children involved. Uh, but since then, it's sort of taken off and there's lots of Marys locally. Uh, and it's a great tradition. It's uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um it was interesting though that I'd seen a bit of footage the other day that it was it was a Mary Lloyd in Manachlog Lee back in the nineteen seventies. So um and when I have taken the Mary out locally, um even though it's not been sort of officially recorded in the Presali area, I have sort of elders from the community coming up and going, Oh, I remember doing that in so and so and so. So there are some memory of it happening, but perhaps it wasn't just officially recorded or noted you know or, you know nowadays we've all got a, a smartphone in our back pocket so it's recorded without us even maybe being conscious of it but yeah so it, these yeah so it, it could be that it was done a lot more in Sally and in Pembrokeshire than history books tell us perhaps. I suppose they're quite informal community-led events, aren't they? So why would that be kind of recorded? Why would it be noticed? Exactly, yeah. No, it, it, and very sort of community-led, small scale. Uh, could just be from a small group of neighbours doing it to each other, you know. It, mm. it, 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 and, you know, it wouldn't be publicised on something like Facebook or anything, would it? So it would be between those people and with, between their memories. So, um, you know, unless sort of National Library of Wales came down and went, oh, they're doing a Mary Lloyd here, let's... Uh, let's sort of, you know, record an archive of that, then, um, yeah, they, it was sort of a, yeah, well, it wasn't as well known then being happening. Do you think they were sort of almost impromptu, but it would almost be a, you know, you'd get to that time of the, the evening and maybe somebody said, oh, let's get the Mary out, and then, all the, you know, it just may well have happened. Up, rather than being, yeah. you know, two weeks next Thursday, let's do that thing. It could well be, yeah, it could be that, that you know, they'd, they'd had enough to drink to think, let's get that horse skull out the back there and we'll go round and we'll scare the neighbours um you know I, I have heard of a lot 
there was a lot more events, um, not in my time, but um, sort of in the time of my maybe grandparents and so on, where, um, you know, entertainment was more stories and, you know, kind of playing pranks on people and frightening people, you know. Uh, you know, that that was a big thing um, because, you know, people weren't stuck in front of TVs all the time, you know. Mm-hmm. So they would be going out and doing these, um, as you said, traditions or kind of, and maybe they, it wouldn't be greatly planned. It would just be, all oh, right, should we get it out now? It's about time. And, you know, and yeah, so it, it may have been a lot more off the cuff, a lot, lot, lot less polished, a lot less health and safety involved and, you know... <laughs> Yeah, you might be right. Are there any sort of special Halloween traditions? What's Halloween in Welsh? Are there any special Halloween traditions? So, Calan Gaeav. Um, I wouldn't say there are any big traditions. It's not like a, you know, Halloween is a very Americanised uh, sort of tradition that the UK has sort of adopted, uh, I don't know how, 20, 30 more years? I don't, I don't know how long now. Um there are, uh, if you look into it, um, uh, traditions involving, um, well, stories and so involving Hukhri um, Gutta, this uh, big black sow with a with a short tail that um, you know would come and haunt you, or you know, and so on. Um, you know, there are some little stories like that, but I don't say see there as uh, I don't know. The, I wouldn't say people make a big celebration out of them now. There are local places such as uh, Castellhenlis that obviously uh, put on events and so on with a pagan lens to it or, you know, a a, a Neolithic or Bronze Age sort of, you know, so that ancient lens on on, um, life in the area, they they will put something on. Uh, But otherwise, I don't think local people get involved with... Kalangayav, but they obviously take the children, you know, they'll take the children out trick or treating or something, but it's not a Welsh tradition, something adopted. Something that's been brought to them, okay. Um, thinking about sort of folklore, um, I, know, I know you know a few local ghost stories. <laughs> um, is there any part of the Mabinogion that touches into the Priscilla area? There's lots of um, stories uh, from the Mabinogion that um, either involve the Preseli area or have got roots here or so on. So uh, I think one of the main ones that I could mention is probably the Turk Truith, um, which is the the wild boar, uh, well, the, the, it was an Irish prince then, um, that was a bit of a shapeshifter. Um, and he had uh, some implements on the top of his head, so a, a razor and um, comb and scissors. Um, and it it stems from Kiluch and Olwen. So um, Kiluch wanted to marry Olwen, but his father was uh, Bendigaid Fran, the the the, um, the giant. And uh, Bendy Gravesbrand would only let Kiluch marry Olwen if um, Kiluch managed to retrieve these implements from the top of the fierce shape-shifting beast that was the Turk Troith. So he recruited the help um, of King Arthur then. Um, and um, Arthur and his men then hunted the Turk Troith from, well, everywhere. But across the Preseli Hills um, and there are some uh, stones uh, some of them are outcrops and a couple of standing stones that are said to be uh, so Kerig maybe on Arthur so the sons of, of Arthur that were killed and turned to stone um, and this Kerig Marchogion at the top which apparently the the, um, the knights of Arthur that were turned to stone uh, eventually, he did retrieve the the implements, um, but I think it was a fierce fight, um, and there was lots of these mini turchtroits going around as well, apparently. So yeah, there's lots of the Mabinogion tales that are rooted in the area. You know, in um, places like Tikan or ancient woodland, you know, they lend themselves to that feeling of of these old folk tales because they're so ancient. Um, 
uh, and you know, there's lots of other associated myths and legends as well, but I think Turch Troith um, has been synonymous with the Braseli area uh, in one of the, or oh, Erev the Stelfors, many years ago now. Uh, I think the Turch Troith, I think it was when it was in Krimich perhaps, it was used as a symbol for the festival, uh, the Turch Troith. Uh, I think there was even a, a song uh, written about it. So, um, yeah, it's been very notable. So you've mentioned a little bit around kind of the identity of the Priscelli area. Um, would you sort of describe the Priscelli in different terms according to the different sorts of people you, you're talking to? Um, you know, what, what, what sort of, how, how do you sort of think about it? How do you describe it in terms of the different sorts of people you're, you're speaking to? Um, I don't know whether I would change the way I speak about it depending on who I'm speaking to really um, I, I think I would say I would describe it the same to visitors as I would to local people um, I don't think I would I would talk about it any differently I don't think mm. in um, terms of uh, so the, the questions are yeah. the place identity so it's sort of if you meet somebody in Cardiff how would you describe it and then it says well if you if you meet them in, say, Carmarthen, would it be a different sort of description? That you, you it know? wouldn't. No, I don't think it would be any different. It would, uh, you know, I, essentially, I would say it's a, a rural upland area in the north of Pembrokeshire that is traditionally Welsh-speaking. Um, it's um, obviously beautiful, um, very uh, agriculturally strong background. Uh, uh, although relies heavily on tourism also uh more modern you know in more modern times um uh, yeah and and you know unique in terms of all of the, it's sort of intangible sort of her- heritage really um i think i'd mentioned the archaeology um cuz you know there's there's a lot of notable archaeology um locally in the Preseli. Um, yeah, I d- but I don't think I would describe it differently to someone if I met them on the street in Cardiff than if I met them, say, you know, in a or... Yeah, I don't think I'd... Okay. I, have, I think the, the answer to this question is fairly obvious. How much do you identify as being from the area? How much, how much do you identify as being a person of the Bruselles? One hundred percent, really. I, I don't. Yeah, there's. I, yeah, I can't think of anywhere else I'd say I was from. <laughs> um, so, so um, I suppose what is, what is it to be from the Priscillas? Um, to be Welsh to begin with, I, I would say, um, you know, Welsh speaking. Um, I don't really know what sets us apart from someone else, really. Um, I suppose our sort of intrinsic connection to the landscape around us, you know, that sort of drives us, I suppose. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what else I could, des- what I, how else I could describe us as, as different, really. Um, mm. You feel a really strong connection with the physical landscape, don't you? And, and all of those kind of associations, you know, the place place names kind of feel emotive. Would you say locally? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I would also say so. Yeah, very connected to the physical landscape. But what I've always said is, is the landscape would be empty and devoid for me if it wasn't for the communities that upheld those. Welsh speaking traditions, characters, um, Tavodiaith, I suppose that sets us apart, um, is, you know, our very unique way of pronouncing Welsh words in the Priscilla area. No one else speaks like us in Wales. Um, so, yeah, I think those things together, um, I suppose, make us unique, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Are there, are there a set of values that, that you think are different in the Priscilla than elsewhere in, in Wales or elsewhere in the UK? Um, I wouldn't say we've got different values. Um, 
I don't know, it's difficult to answer that. Okay. Um. <laughs> okay. okay, and obviously you feel a tremendously positive sense of attachment to the area. Do you think the area is a welcoming place to people from, from outside of the Preseli? Yes, I think generally it, it is very welcoming. Um, going back to what I've said earlier in the interview, I think people have been cautious uh, over the last few years with their welcome because they feel like its incomers have been threatening mm -hmm. to the culture and, and to their communities. Mm -hmm. So it's been difficult, and I've felt this personally, to welcome everyone with open arms because you feel that, oh, are you going to buy all our houses? Um, you know, we can't afford to live here, you know. Um, uh, you know, so it, it, it's it's been... It's been a delicate balance there, I think. Um, and I think I'm not the only one that's felt that. I think there's other people that uh, feel that um, incomers, whether they are um, people coming to live here or tourists, have been a threat in some ways, um, especially over COVID when it was so busy everywhere. Um, and, you know, you want... To welcome visitors because obviously you know we've got a beautiful landscape here and we want to share our culture um, but it's that delicate balance between not eroding the very culture that we want to promote um, so yeah I think generally we'd all like to say that we welcome people and I think people generally are extremely uh, welcoming but I think it's been a challenge for people to be very open with that when they feel that um, some of our communities are losing their hearts basically because um, the next generation aren't able to continue living uh, and you know maintaining that cultural identity that sets us apart from anywhere else okay where where are um, people coming to the area where, where, where are they coming from what sorts of people where are they coming from as visitors? Well, just the incomers. I suppose people coming into the community to, um, to live, I suppose, but, but both. I mean, where, 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 where do, in your, your mind, where do tourists come from first then? And then where do the people that come to live here, where do they come from? Um, so tourists, um, I suppose, I don't know. I, like, it's only now and again I come across them. Um, Mainly because I try in in the in the peak season, I try and find the the the, the places that are off the beaten track, so that I'm not uh, not in the middle of of all of the um, hustle and bustle of it. Um, you know, I've I've met uh, sort of European tourists uh, out and about, so possibly German um, and so on. Uh, you know, obviously during COVID, there was a lot of people that were here from the UK because they were on a staycation. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot. Of, you know, there's yeah. I think we we have a lot of visitors from all over. Really, I can't pinpoint um, specifics. Um, I suppose in terms of income as coming to live here, the majority of them are from England, um, and I think. Uh, you know, Wales has had a long history um, uh, of um, English rule oppression. Um, so they are, um, you know, very sensitive to that. And obviously, you know, there's no point hiding the fact that, you know, um, the British Empire is one of the biggest... Uh, colonising forces in the history of the world and obviously little old Wales has been sat next to it all this time and you know it's a miracle really that we've managed to maintain our language and our identity being uh, connected um, <laughs> by land to, to it um, so I think um, you know that's why people obviously do get very passionate about maintaining their Welshness uh, with regard to you know, English incomers, you know. And uh, that's not to say that people aren't welcoming to people coming to live here permanently. 
Um, and a lot of people come to live here permanently and they embrace the language, the way of life, the culture, and they want to really get involved with living uh, every single facet of Priscelli life, really. Not just the fact that, ooh, lovely views here, pity about the Welsh people, um, it, <laughs> you know, but that's a very small minority. But um, I think normally people are coming to live here uh, are probably people that have um, made more money in their lifetimes in England uh, and have come here to retire a lot of the time. Um, you know, Wales comparatively in terms of the earning potential salaries are far lower than that of people that may be living close to London and so on. And of course, we don't blame them because it's beautiful down here. Um, and maybe we don't want to share it all, but... Um, yeah, it's uh, yeah, it, it yeah. Okay, great. Um, I suppose so. The question, the question here is: Are there some groups that would find it hard to become uh, accepted in the area? But from what you're saying, it's those people that are willing to open them themselves to local language and culture will be accepted by virtue of that. Is that? Yeah, and I think as I was saying earlier. The way that our communities have changed, uh, you know, over the last, say, 20 years, um, we've had a lot more incomers. So um, I think a lot of people coming to live here would find it easy to be accepted, provided they, you know, well, dep- depends where they want to put their friendships, social circles and so on, I suppose. Um, but if you're looking to be accepted by you know, the Welsh speaking communities and, you know, the the, the native communities and individuals, um, then, yeah, they, you know, they would love it even if you learnt the, the, how to say the place names properly and how to say the nice cities of Borodan, Diolch and Shumai and so on, you know, that goes an awful long way, you know. I think people realise that not everyone has the ability, time or you know, resource to learn a complete new language. Um, Although some people would argue if you were going to move to a different country with a language such as France or Germany or Spain or wherever else that you might have gone, you would have had to have learned the basics to get by, you know? And um, I think um, maybe that is the fault of how Wales is promoted on a broader scale, not just to the rest of the world, but how it is perceived in England. Uh, perhaps people don't realise that that uh, Welsh communities are very much thriving and they speak Welsh here and it's part of their daily life. Uh, maybe there's... Um, yeah, maybe it's not uh, purposeful ignorance, but maybe they're just not aware until they get here and they've landed in the middle of it. Um, so yeah, I think you know to be accepted here in a you know in Welsh speaking communities that are traditional but are on that that are in challenging times um, because of uh, lots of factors that affect uh, the language. I think people would be really appreciative of people moving in if they made an effort to learn a bit of the language and to promote the fact and to keep it alive. Great. Do you think, so coming back to your own place identity, um, with a sense of place for the Priscillis, uh, do you think that other people have a sort of a sense of place locally, you know, is it that, that there is a broader sense of being from the Priscillis across others, or do you think you feel it more strongly than others? Oh, no, there's definitely a broad sense of it. Mm-hmm. It's definitely, you know, a thing. Um, uh, as I said, you know, things like the way that we speak, the Tavodieth links us all um, in mm-hmm. the words we use, in the specific words that nowhere else in Wales uses and so on. Uh, yeah, it's definitely felt by a broad range of people, not just myself. I think that connection to that place, you know, they call us, going back to the Tavodieth, a broa waste waste, they call us that in other parts of Wales, because we say waste instead of ice. So there are a lot of uh, things that we would say a W in front of instead of a zero and an O then. Um, 
and um, yeah so there's lots of things that I think we know sets us apart from other areas in Wales I suppose Brilliant and obviously you feel very strongly part of that broader sort of local identity Yeah, yeah Great um, So obviously you speak Welsh um, you'd consider Welsh to be your first language? Um, no it, it was I'd say f- it's a mixture of both really my m- mother as I said moved down here from Shropshire uh, that was probably in the when was it um, late 70s or something I suppose or mid 70s um, obviously English speaking she went to a Scobasali but was put into the English stream so didn't learn any Welsh really although um, she she knows a lot of Welsh by now um, but um, you know we spoke quite a lot of English at home my father's fault really because he would just kind of speak so that my mother would understand as well so I would say that um, yeah it wasn't a clear one or the other uh, it may have even been more English rather than Welsh to begin with um, so obviously when I went to to um, you know a school vestry in a nursery school and so whatever I learned Welsh straight away then and you know children learn you know other languages so fast that um, yeah so I, I can't say it was one or the other really mm-hmm. okay but you, you sort of learned, learned through school and then presumably you took that home and then would speak yeah yeah and obviously we live very close you know um, with Welsh speaking family members so you know we spoke Welsh and English every day mm-hmm. both languages I would say mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so um, yeah I can't say which is first <laughs> and there's other so that's so the broader family who were, who were Welsh speaking who you presumably you, they would be considered sort of Welsh first language yes definitely yeah but they they still spoke English yeah they were able to speak English maybe some of the older uh, generation at the time uh, weren't uh, quite as confident in English as they were in Welsh uh, or you'd get someone like my my mum Guy, my grandmother who you spoke to her in Welsh and she'd answer in English and you speak to her in English she'd answer in Welsh just because <laughs> she just would basically um, but um, yeah, you, you know they were, they, they could speak English yeah mm-hmm. Um in terms of Welsh speakers across the Preseli, you say it's a Welsh speaking area. Without obviously the conversation we just had around people coming in who don't speak who don't speak Welsh. Do you think most local born and bred families are Welsh speakers? What sort of proportion would you say that was? I don't know now. Um <clears throat> uh, there are a lot of people that have moved here with children as well as retired people and you know fantastically they obviously send their children to Welsh schools in the local area because um, I think pretty much all the primary schools here are Welsh first language schools um, but I, whether that is I don't think they speak much Welsh at home then so there obviously are Welsh, lots of Welsh first language families and children in the area there's a lot of people that that attend school and they only get Welsh in school uh, and or maybe some social activities, but most of the time English is what they speak at home then. Okay. Um, what does what what does what does local heritage mean to you? I think it just uh, to me it's all the different layers. Uh, of history and culture um, to make up our identity in the Preseli era I suppose it's just all these layers of whether it's the myths and legends or whether it's the farming heritage or you know the cultural estevod sort of heritage or our language um, or you know place names um yeah, and all of the sort of intangible sort of natural heritage, 
geology, archaeology, it's all those layers really mm. uh, over time um, that, yeah, that, that sort of give the place its identity. Mm. It's so what are the most important aspects of local cultural heritage? Um, I don't know what the most important one is, really. Like, for me, I think it's generally uh, the language itself, um, because that that gives colour to everything else around us, really. Um, I think without that, I think it would it would be very black and white. It wouldn't it wouldn't have any life to it. So I think the language brings to life all of the other things I've just mentioned, really. Okay. So moving on from where we were. Um... What's the most important aspects of local natural heritage in the in, in the area? Um, obviously, the Preseli area is situated within Pembroke Coast uh, National mm-hmm. Park. It's uh, even though it's the only coastal national park in the UK, there's a large proportion of the the land that they cover that is actually inland. Obviously, it's still very close to the coast and you can see the sea from the Preseli Mountains um, but yeah it, it, it's a big inland um, space um, so obviously because it has that national park designation it is protected in lots of other ways that other parts of the county are not some of the Preseli communities are actually just outside the park they're not counted in the park's sort of jurisdiction uh, but a lot of obviously the footpaths and things weave in and out of them so um, I think the fact that it is that big swathe of open moorland really and heathland um, is probably the most important part of its natural heritage history um, it has been sheep grazed for many, many generations now. The grazing practices have changed though. There used to be a lot of uh, maybe slightly less sheep grazing and a lot more heavy grazers, so cattle and ponies. There's still ponies that graze, but less ponies because obviously um, there's sort of less farmers and individuals keeping uh ponies now there's obviously a lot more maintenance and so on to do with with those and they're not so much of a a farming people would have ponies because maybe they'd be using them on you know they they'd keep a few of them and use them instead of a quad bike for herding and so for getting the sheep up you know gathering the hill Uh, i don't think anyone gathers the hill via via pony horseback now um so yeah so you know those grazers maintain the biodiversity of the mountainside um so i think yeah that that, that's probably the fact that the land itself is the the biggest um and obviously there's lots of other um plants animals and organisms that you know thrive off that in that web of biodiversity really of, of of the mountainside itself I think that answers. I don't know if that answers the question. No, that's good. That's good. Um, if you had to show off one aspect of the Preselis to a friend who was visiting, but not from the area, what would it be? What's the What's one thing, cultural or natural, that kind of for you is either spectacular in, in what it is, I suppose, or, or, or sort of definitive in, in terms of defining the area? So if I have friends coming that maybe coming either from outside of the area completely or, you know, from other parts of Pembrokeshire. Um, you know, I have got interest in, in the standing stones and so on locally. I class myself as a bit of a stone botherer. So, you know, I would like to... That's what I would showcase to people is is the amount of um, stones, really, whether it be standing stones or the cromlechs that we've got, the, the dolmens, the, you know, the burial chambers, like Pentrevan... Uh, and there's Carreg Cotin Arthur down in Newport, or you know, if we go a little bit further out to the coast, there's Lechard Ribez um, in Trewydale, in Moyle Grove, and so on. Um, but I think also 
I always take people down to Tucanol, to the woodlands, because there's nowhere else like it, really. You know, you go in there and it feels so ancient and mythical in there. Um, and the, the stone, uh, stony outcrops above them, the, the cairns um, that overlook Tucanol, uh, again, um, you know, so, so the three three hundred and sixty degree view really of um, the Braselli Mountains, but also down to the coast as well. Um, yeah, I think those are the main things that I would mm-hmm. no, main places and things that I would. So those that rocky outcrop above the canal is kind of maybe on Owen, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, that sort of brings me on to. The question: How would you describe what? What would you describe the physical landscape of the Preseli to be like? And is it different in different parts of the Preseli? Or, or yeah, so it's you know across the board really. It's it's uh, it's damp, it's mountainous, uh, and it's and it's very craggy, like stone stones. But it's um, you know there's a lot. The specific type of stones here, obviously the the varying, um, you know, blue stones and so on. Um, you know, if you go to somewhere that's just outside the Preseli area, like uh, Wolf's Castle, that has these sort of stone cairns above the the village there. Um, you know, that stone is completely different to in the Preseli. It's a completely different stone. So yeah, I think that sets it apart. So yeah, I said the the weather, the the sort of the the upland nature of it, but also the the um, geology, as in the the cairns and so on. I think that's what sets it apart. And then you have got these little pockets, Tikano being the largest of this sort of ancient woodland. And, you know, there would have been far more uh, patches of this sort of oak, Cecil oak woodland around the area as well. I would imagine, but obviously it has been cleared over. Millennia, I suppose. Okay, what are the what are some of the most interesting features of the physical landscape of Craven? So these these sort of bluestone quarries and things, um, mm-hmm. uh, whether they have been quarried for stones that have been taken to Stonehenge or not, um, they themselves are fascinating. Uh, you know, there's one Craig Rossavellian down at the bottom of Brimberian here. There have been digs that have happened down there but that's quite spectacular as you mentioned Carnet maybe on Owen the Cairns up there um, very notable in the landscape and there's some um, across the ridge line of the Preseli then sort of you know Carn Goidog Carn Bresseb uh, so different sort of Cairns really that are yeah notable uh, aside from the the mountains themselves and they're not huge mountains they're not they're not uh, you know in, in the same vein as say um, Erri, Snowdonia, or even the Cambrian mountains, but um, they are mountains to us locally, and you know they they are notable. Are there any sort of um, folk tales or, or kind of almost I don't know, religious or spiritual associations with with the physical landscape? Yeah, so um, again, Carnid maybe on our own, that's a classic story, really. So of the. Um, the three giants that uh, you know lived in the Preseli area, and their father very foolishly didn't leave a will when he passed away. So it's it's said that they had a, a big big fight, an argument, battle between them, uh, and in the process of their battle, they were obviously being giants. They were flinging around these stones across the the Preseli area. So that's why apparently you've got these bits and pieces of, of stone across the area and um, eventually they all sort of killed each other in this grand battle and then they they turned into these canes themselves. Uh, so there are stories such as that and obviously I mentioned the story of the Turk Truth earlier and uh, the being uh, sons and knights of Arthur that turned to stone in... Uh, in, in the local area as well and so there are certain folklore there's also uh, Be Avank obviously in Brimberian which is said to be a water monster that bothered the local community of Brimberian and lived under the bridge um, and there's a few different kind of uh, variables in this story but essentially 
this there's a gallery grave uh, out on the moorland by Brimberian and it looks like the hubs of a monster. Um, so they say that that is where uh, they kind of tricked this this um, water monster and buried him, or he was, you know, he fell into this hole, and yeah, that was the end of him. So there are, yeah, there's stories to do with the the geology and otherwise uh, to denote the, the stones tales. <laughs> Good. Um, in terms of biodiversity. Um, what what do you think are the most important kind of plants, animals, or habitats in the area? So um, again, Tikanol uh, woodland, uh, ancient woodland. It is a triple SI um, because of the uh, traditional nature of the way it has been grazed over years and years and years. It is host to lots of rare uh, lichen and so on on the trees there. Um, and it's still grazed by ponies and sheep uh, on occasion now so they maintain that open light aspect of the woodlands that let these rare lichen thrive uh, there are parts of the Priscelli, um that are host to um, rare fungi and wax caps which are only found in sort of ancient grassland sites and so on um, and obviously, as as is being discovered these days, you know, fungi is uh, really the 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 web that holds everything else together. So there are lots of other ancient sort of uh, sites that are again grassland that have got rare plants. Um, so you know, meadows and uh, you know herbal plants and so on that grow in them. Um, we do have Merlin, which is like the one of the smallest bird of prey in Wales. They they do frequent the top of the Priscillas, and I was lucky to see one up by Royal Concarwin a couple of years ago. Uh, we've got lots of kites here now, more than we've ever done before, and seems to be a lot of birds of prey uh, in the area. I don't know if it's because I've got old and I've suddenly started to notice them, or whether they're just sort of prolific. Um, yeah, so it it there's a lot of little hot spots of biodiversity here, so it is special in terms of um, in the natural world here as well. Are there any um, sort of folk tales or superstitions around plants or animals um, for local communities? Is there anything that might be seen as sort of a good omen or a bad omen or anything, anything like that? Yes. Uh, I think there are a few. Um, there's one obviously the stories related to Saint Brunach, um, who used to commune with the angels on top of Carningly and so on. But there's a story about him and his be, uh, beloved cow Bloodwen down in Nevin, um, whereby some uh, brutes had come come by and wanted this lovely cow for their their uh, supper. So they were trying to boil her up and. Um, it wouldn't boil and so they, they got very angry and they went down and Brynach was waiting for for them and uh, Brynach offered them, because they were so angry and hungry, some um, vegetable soup um, and when they came out from eating the vegetable soup, this is abridged by the way, um, <laughs> coming out from eating their vegetable soup, what what did they see but uh, Brynach's beloved cow Bloodwen grazing in the field next door. So. They hadn't dispatched her in the end, or if they had, and she was, you know, there was some sort of magics involved. <laughs> so uh, there are a few stories like that, and um, there may be other stories. Uh, I think there's other ones about snakes and fairies, and there's all sorts of stories here to do with man and animal. And I suppose that's because people have lived so closely to the landscape for so long. Yes, definitely, yeah. yeah. Okay. What do you think are the biggest challenges facing the Priscelli at the moment? And I know you've touched on a couple of those. Yeah, so the the um the housing and uh sort of influx of incomers, that kind of uh issue is, is something that um you know is a challenge, the Priscelli area. Um I think uh if, you know the the agricultural communities are facing many challenges. Um, 
a lot of the small family run farms are becoming unsustainable now um they can't keep up with the bigger farms there's lots of you know there's the prices of, of feeding the animals or maintaining the land or you know keeping vehicles machinery on the road it all costs um so yeah it, it is a worry to think about where these uh small agricultural businesses will disappear to because in many instances they are the last strongholds of the welsh language in the rural communities because usually if everything else leaves the community in terms of uh welsh language jobs it's more likely that the agricultural ones stay but if they are disappearing then that is a real worry to some of these rural communities um so that is is a worry um you know in terms of climate change um you know the Priscilla area isn't isn't uh, sort of you know it, it's going to be affected it is being affected by you know the longer wetter winters the very very dry um you know summers and so on and very hot and um obviously there is a, a tradition uh of uh, burning the heather and the heathland to make way for new growth on the hillside every year you know that has been done for many many years and that is a a controversial topic for many because many don't agree with that practice however that is becoming a problem because it it you know for many people they think that it does need to be done every every year to allow for that new growth and for it not to become all interlocked and and grazable and unusable not just to animals but to walkers and so on as well um but with the dry dry winters um uh, the wet wet winters and the dry dry summers it's very difficult to find a time that that can actually take place and even in the summer you're kind of worried that there may be wildfires and so on on the hillside which obviously not only threaten the biodiversity of the hills and the 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 natural aspects of it but also the the communities that live nearby you know the, it's a worry that they may be having to evacuate or so on so there's um yeah there are many sort of worries and threats to the Priscilla area from multiple angles i suppose okay <clears throat> do you think though that um that there's that there's something promising in the future for the area um well, you know, you, you look out on the landscape and it's hard not to be hopeful, really. You know, it's, you know, especially when the sun is shining, I suppose. But, um, yeah, I think there are, there are many opportunities to showcase to the world um, our unique uh, cultural heritage here. I think that that hasn't been done uh, as much as what you know could be done um i think you know maybe we've been painted as being the same as the rest of pembrokeshire when it's not really the case so i think there is a a unique opportunity there for us to um not sell ourselves but to be known uh, as who we really are here Mm -hmm. yeah and communities here are resilient aren't they yeah they they're pretty tough uh they're tough cookies um so um you know they they're very good at um you know helping helping themselves to help themselves i suppose they they um they are there's you know key community members i suppose in each area that um are very good at maintaining and and uh, trying to protect what's important to them so yeah and I think COVID showed that. I think uh, you know the pandemic. Um, you know they they all you know club together to help each other, whether that have been through food shopping or connection or whatever. I suppose. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, and I suppose finally wrapping it up. Is there anything else that you'd like to mention? Anything else you'd like to talk about, or is there any questions that you'd like to have been asked that we haven't been asked that you haven't been asked? Um. No. no, no. I think uh, we've covered a, a broad range, broad <laughs> broad range of topics today. Okay, thank you very much, Sophie. Thank you, Stuart.